Thanks so much, Tatiana, for uh, the introduction, and thanks for stealing 15 minutes of our panel. So I'm going to have to try to figure out how to to uh, organize this panel with uh, within the time zone. Uh, but super excited to moderate this panel. First of all, um, I'm really excited to always moderate the last panel because then you actually see who is really committed and still is in the room. Uh, so yeah, I'm sure that we will have a great uh, uh, engagement uh, with uh, the, the ones that are still here. But secondly, I think it's really interesting because yesterday was all about research and today it's really about how do we actually go from research into action. And I think this panel and also the previous one was already reflecting on how do we actually go from data intelligence to decision intelligence. And that is really what uh, I hope uh, we will have a discussion during the, the panel as well. And the second reason why I think it's great uh, for uh, organizing this panel is to really reflect on can regions also be hubs of experimentation and innovation, right? What can we learn from different regions and how do they actually go about uh, using research in uh, implementing and advancing the, um, uh, the movement towards uh, perhaps a skill-based uh, labor market as well. And so we have four distinguished uh, panelists. And uh, again, I will introduce uh, each panelist who will then come to the um, table here and give a short presentation, given the, <laughs> given the time that we have all allotted to it. And, and I do want to have a conversation with the audience as well around what you want to share. And we will kick us off with uh, Ave Ungro, who is from the Estonian Qualifications Authority, where she is in charge uh, to develop a skills system. And she will look at tools that predict technological change and how that then can help policymakers uh, design inclusive labor markets. Over to you. I think the heat will help actually to keep it short. So. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, so today I will uh, speak about three tools, but actually in Estonia we have of course used in Estonian Qualifications Authority more than three tools, but uh, let's uh, keep it um, simple. So I will talk about, I will basically travel through time machine also because I will talk about something that we have used for seven years uh, to impact policymakers uh, regarding the technological change uh, happening in Estonia but also in other countries, of, of, of course. Uh, I will also talk about the tool that um, we are planning, we are still developing, and I will also talk about fantasies. <laughs> so, let's see. So, um, they are Oscar Anticipation System, something that we have developed some years ago, uh, and uh, successfully managed to, to fulfill this, uh, these ideals that came with it. We are now developing sk skill system and uh, we are also planning to use future, in the future more automated uh, tools uh, uh, to uh, um, anticipate uh, problems. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So, um, uh, I can't see the slides here. Maybe I get it. Okay. I will then look at the screen. Doesn't matter. <laughs> it's okay. So um, uh, some of these problems are probably familiar to you. So we have um, uh, the proportions of graduates from different fields of education is not in line with job opportunities, but the um, this is something that we um, try to take flexibly, and uh, we see that we, uh, there are several problems for this to happen, and some of them um, are um, happening uh, whether we try to change it or not. So, so, so there is a certain kind of like understanding that uh, we cannot cope with this, uh, we cannot uh, overcome it completely. Uh, curricula are not always up to date and uh, streamlined with the needs of society and economy. Uh, for that to change um, what society needs and economy needs has to somehow be phrased 
and, uh, and uh, said out loud. And also some sort of common understanding needs to be found, and this is a difficult task. Uh, a common platform to connect the education system and economy entrepreneurs follows. So we try to achieve that. And um, our public uh, employment service lacks foresight of labor and skills needs uh, by sector and occupation. So, so more granular, granular approach uh, is needed. And um, migration policy also is something that... Uh, we try to impact with OSCA anticipation system. So what we have done is basically sectoral service uh, of labor and skills needs, reports, five economic sectors every year. Uh, in five years, all economic sectors are covered. We try to achieve comparable results. Um, so methodology here is crucial. Um, we, our forecast, forecast, uh, forecast horizon is five to 10 years. Uh, very important for us, something that many countries do not do, but we want to do, or e even if it's really time consuming, is that we also incorporate qualitative data, not only quantitative. And we, uh, we do quite many interviews. We have sectoral expert panels. Now, this is crucial because this is something where we can actually impact the policy making the most we have seen. And uh, we analyze qualifications across all levels of education. So, um, from basic education to the highest level. And uh, also, very important, we, we say that we don't want to make this service to the drawers. Throwers, yeah, we are to, on the shelves, so we we monitor the results every year and we see what has been the impact and what has changed since the survey was published. Now this is where I wanted to uh, actually talk a little bit more, but I will not do it. Maybe the panel discussion opens up the possibility for that, but crucial. Collaboration, taking all the stakeholders together. It seems so um, essential, so natural, it's so hard to achieve. And uh, with different agendas, even harder. And um, we have seen, maybe it's an Estonian problem, because uh, Estonians are not very, maybe, um, uh, <laughs> Maybe there is kind of like also cultural issue here, I don't know. But uh, to put people together to talk is an issue. And, uh, and so uh, we try to make it happen on our, in our expert panels, in our coordination council, coordination council where we have uh, different stakeholders together. Uh, I would say that uh, maybe this is one of the biggest strengths of Oscar uh, during the last years. Now, regarding the technological change, we, uh, we see several um, different mismatches, but um, one of the biggest that we, for example, this is just an example of the results that we have had in Oscar surveys. Uh, the survey on manufacturing industry in Estonia um, uh, resulted uh, in the statement that in Estonia only one third of engineering positions is covered, one third. So basically like we have two, third, like, uh, two thirds lacking. And uh, we uh, really hit that drum hard. And for example, just last week, as a result of it, um, a new so-called engineering academy was put into force. So maybe, maybe this, this is something where we see those palpable results. Now this is something that we are de developing at this moment. Uh, so uh, it's already beyond OSCA, the skills system. So we have environment of descriptions with the classification uh, we are creating skills profiles, skills assessment uh, tools, and also analysis environment for 
statistical purposes. And in the future, let's see if we can make uh, AI into use in order to um, understand the mismatches between the curriculas and, uh, and the job uh, uh, opportunities, we tried a pilot project with a Finnish company for that and uh, here are some of the kind of like visualizations of this. There were many problems we faced, which I'm happy to talk about later, but uh, we saw also a great potential. And future challenges will be to have I stress this word palpable impact. So even if we have an impact that is kind of like uh, in distant future, we need more cases like this engineering academy to happen so that we feel like, like there, is, there is actually something happening. Uh, more detail is needed. Uh, societal demand, a big subject. Um, but uh, basically, as, um, as uh, many have already mentioned, it's not always about supply and demand. We cannot take this subject, subject from this kind of like pluses and minuses uh, together only from this perspective. And uh, regional demand as well, something that we have to investigate more. That's it. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Avi, and uh, thanks for keeping it within the time and uh, fascinating uh, uh, skills uh, tool that you are presented here. Over to Pirita Ihamaki, uh, who is from RoboCoast, which is another new um, nonprofit center of excellence focused on AI, robotics, and cybersecurity, and where she is responsible to focus on skill development and regional resiliency. Over to you. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Then I only put it here. That's a PDF. It's not a PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. No, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, uh, I'm happy to be here, and I'm coming from Robocos, uh, Digital Innovation Hubs. Just one, one month ago, we was selected in Commission, European Digital Innovation Hubs, and we have been done from this work uh, still 2017, and this is the like, uh, third, one, third time that we have uh, evaluated about it to do our job. And here is, you can see the map. Uh, Robocoast is that who we are, and we are nine region area in Finland, with which we are largest one, European Digital Innovation Arms. And as you mentioned about earlier, that we are interesting about AI, cyber security, uh, all digital uh, digitalization skills, and that kind of things. And what we here today, example, very good uh, opportunity that we don't have enough skills, and we are lack of that. But uh, our, th our things is that helping that we combine together uh, academic world and we combine industrial world. And I can say that because I'm both of world, because I'm evening time ac academic, I'm doing also research, we are not speaking the same language. And that's the pr really, really problem because academic people, you love your uh, research, and sometimes um, an industry world, when you talk about especially big companies, and they have own goals. And when you combine them together, and when researchers start speaking about it, uh, it comes confusions because of uh, the language is a little bit different. And that's what we try to match. And we also offer, uh, offer about financial opportunities as a, a horizon projects and those kind of things. And we are looking forward to in intensifying the collaboration wide network locally, nationally, and European level. And creating more competitiveness and support to green growth and manufacturing SMA by using digital technology, essential for Finland and Europe. And we need to serve also as a digital European program, 20% of European companies come to access our markets and we serve them and help them to come, 
can and whatever needs they have. And what, how we do this, uh, we go to companies, we asking what you need. We are never going to serve our services, that this is our services, this is a service table, what do you want? Uh, we always ask me what you want, what you want from us. And that's, we start to discuss about it. And here you can see uh, more. Uh, this is the competence centers. We have 15 universities belong our competence centers and University of Applying Science. I collected our partners, EDI and uh, Digital Innovation, have, which have 23 different kind of uh, ecosystems, which if we don't have a knowledge, then we can call the partners. And then you can see to our customer journey robocost services. Uh, sometimes company come to uh, access our seminars where we share sometimes uh, best practices. Uh, generally we have, uh, you know, I will talk about it, AI roundtable is the one of the things what we do now. And this is, was a very successful story because uh, it's happened that we combine only Finnish uh, companies and that's way. But now we are in whole European level and, and, and giving this opportunity for our partners. And the same day we have a seminar uh, locally, but we have international same times. We are connecting in the internet and the seminars is, uh, is uh, we are listening to our other speakers. And especially AI is the one of the things what um, uh, digitalization is about, what the uh, European level wants. That one of the things what we th think about it, that to have good AI practices, um, we are not yet even closer what can AI do in the future. We are little step by AI. And, and as um, Eva, Eva mentioned about this, uh, uh, Finnish companies is our cities, it's head eye, call it head eye. And every curriculum, uh, I, I even love that story because how I write it, my curriculum, there's the words, what I'm using, but there's a somebody who read about my curriculum, maybe use it some other words, but then there is a cloud and this is explain it, what kind of skills I have. And if I uh, if I'm doing the, if I applying the job that can help me about defining job because uh, they can see they, the AI could un understand and at what kind of job I'm looking for. But do I have those skills? It's can uh, operate it for me. And if I'm also said about it, this a little bit about it. We are doing coaching. We have test laboratories. We have 30 different test laboratories. And you can come access them. As part of the uh, services are free. And some, if you're going really details and that kind of things, of course, company need to pay it about some services. We also do research. But uh, research, what we do, is always uh, what company wants. We are not doing research like um, what I want, uh, like a researcher. <laughs> it's always coming company side. Of course, we give it also investment readiness review. Uh, are the companies enough readiness to get the invest? And, and, and if it's not, especially technological small company, uh, we have in our area 10 AI companies and we have 100 robotics companies. Why in this area have happened that? It's a historical things because we have old factories and they see that uh, we needed something, digital skills, and it start, started, um, one company said about, one manager said some, one, one time ago, many, many years ago, that we are not want to do anything about robotics things. And then the workers make own company, and it's the now 140 million company, and because the work know what's happening in the future, but the manager don't know it. And this is one of the things what we do is challenge competition that, uh, as you mentioned about automation, this wagon needed 30 men to clean it, that wagon. And there's coming 300, those wagons. But now when we do it, this com uh, challenge competition, we get it, those workers going to, uh, to another job, they go to school, they get, get new skills, and they get something better job to then to cleaning those wagons. And this is a no robot doing this. This kind of things, robotization and automation, is good to do it. 
And this is uh, some example. There's a small company who bring those uh, exoskeletons, and we offer demo days that they can go and get the references that they go to bigger markets. And this is what I mentioned is AI, AI roundtable services. Now it's, it's happened locally. We, we bring together those companies who don't know nothing about AI and who want, they know the words AI, but they don't know what to do with it. We bring in them kind of companies, we bring in the examples of theirs. There's example, energy examples from Poland. We bring into different countries example, how they manage, how they do it, what is the good practicing, and then they share it, this knowledge for all of them. And now we have that kind of EU level that even I get calls from EU, my colleague, and they said about we want to do this kind of AI roundtable in our country, how we do it. And I help them, and then we build together the same seminar that Bulgarian have the same day. The seminar we have in Finland, we have in Romania, we have in Italy, we have in other countries, and we combine them together by, by the teams. Example. Thank you for this practical. Thank you so much, uh, Pirita. Very fascinating um, um, presentation, and also very fascinating to even reflect on uh, a lot of the discussions about how AI impacts skills, but how can we use AI to actually attest skills and readiness? And I think uh, Pillar might actually look into uh, another research kind of component on what's the current state of using AI for skills assessment and then subsequently even understanding what the future might be. And it seems like we might not be ready yet, but at least we need to understand what the potential is here as well. Over to the next speaker, um, which is um, uh, Sane Omunikan, and I'm sure that was uh, wrongly uh, <laughs> pronounced. Over to you to uh, rectify me, who is uh, in charge of the uh, economic graph policy at uh, LinkedIn. And we already heard from Sane yesterday on green jobs, but now Sane will focus on the potential of actually economic graph for policymaking. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shane Omwinikon, which is how you pronounce that collection of letters that is written on your, uh, on, on, on your program in front of you. And uh, as Stefan said, I'm here on behalf of LinkedIn. Um, I lead LinkedIn's uh, policy research, which we refer to as Economic Graph Research and Insights, where we use the data and insights shared with us by our members on their profiles to help achieve and realize uh, with policymakers LinkedIn's vision, uh, which is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. I'm conscious that we're short on time, so I'm not going to use all the slides uh, that I have available, but what I, what I want to do today is position this discussion in the context of what we've heard so far in terms of the tools that we believe LinkedIn Insights provides to policymakers in assisting them to tackle, address, and understand um, some of the labor market issues that are facing European economies at the moment. So, for folks that mightn't be immediately familiar with, with LinkedIn, we are a social network for professionals. Uh, we have uh, over 830 million members in over 200 countries and territories around the world, but also have uh, the representation of uh, 58 million uh, companies and employers, over 120,000 uh, higher education institutions, and then our own standardized taxonomy for the measurement of skills of over 39,000 uh, standardized, standardized skills. So that gives you an, a, an indication of the extent uh, of the insights that we can derive uh, from the information shared with uh, our members uh, on, their, on their profiles. And what I will do today is take you through some of the real-life examples where we have used these insights uh, to inform policy. I hope that will give fruit for our discussion uh, later on today in terms of how uh, those insights could be used at a regional level, because a lot of the work we do can be done both at national and subnational level too. So our team, the team that I work on, we work in three primary, primary ways. And apologies to people who attended the green session yesterday. You'll have seen from this material already. 
That is through the sharing of our, of our insights. Uh, we don't just provide data. We don't just hand CSV files over. We actually have a team of economists and researchers who help to understand the trends and the motivations behind some of the insights that are derived from our platform. We also partner with both research organizations, policy-making organizations, and multilateral organizations from around the world. So we've partnered with the likes of Eurostat, the European Central Bank, the World Economic Forum, uh, BMAS uh, and IFO in Germany, the French Ministry of the Economy, and so on. So we do have a, a, a great pride in the fact that we don't just hand over, hand over data, but actually that we participate in the common research design to help understand uh, problems. And then thirdly, we, we believe in making our findings accessible to the public. So we have a microsite, economicgraph.linkedin.com, where you can explore a number of the tools that we've created to help understand and navigate some of the issues regarding the labor market uh, at the moment. And you can see uh, some of those that focus on the green economy, uh, career pathway resilience, uh, and uh, gender equality as well. One of the things that we would say is that when we do work with our policy partners and research organizations, our role isn't to replace official sources of data. Our role is to augment and enhance the ability of policymakers to understand the problems that, that they face. And we think that LinkedIn data is in a good position to be able to do that. Why? Because we do have a, a global reach. We can compare hundreds of countries and cities right across the globe in terms of the same consistent taxonomy that we have and the same consistent uh, categorization that we have. We have granular data, so we can go down to multiple, multiple levels of granularity. So industry, occupation, education level, location, skill acquisition as well. Our, our, our data is near real time, so as contrasting to survey-based approaches, members are constantly updating their profiles on their platform. So we get maybe not an instant uh, map of the global labor market or the global economy, but we do get a very near real time picture of what that, of what that looks like. And we then have a, the ability to monitor these patterns over time, so able to look at things like migration patterns uh, in a historical context as well all of which are useful both at a national and a regional level to, un to use those tools to understand the problems that are facing, facing regions. And in fact, some of our earlier work was working with regions across the European Union, the likes of Stockholm, Milan, Munich, to help them understand their local labour market, primarily because in many cases they didn't have access to the sort of data they needed to inform their skills budgets, but also it gave them a new impression of where their city or region sat in terms of comparison with around the world. In terms of the, the research that we do, we don't um, have the approach of where we take orders and then we, we give, out the, give out the report. We, at the start of a research cycle, would set out what are the global themes that we think are of interest to the policymaking uh, community. And at the moment, we have four kind of large bodies of work that we're focusing on. One, which you have heard about yesterday, is green and the whole focus on the sustainable economy. The second is an area we're very proud of, which is on gender equity and understanding the barriers that face, in particular, women in the workplace, both in terms of uh, new and emerging jobs, but also in terms of their uh, access and ability to take on uh, access to leadership uh, positions in the workforce. We are uh, currently in a very large body of work called Career Pathways, where we look at that question of resilience. How do we embed resilience into the labour force and economies around the world? How do we assist people to pivot through their careers and make sure that the interventions that the state makes uh, allow them to make, that, to make that pivot and that skills ultimately are the building block that allow proper transition through, through a career? And then finally, uh, a piece of work that is very, I think, topical in, in Europe at the moment is focusing on the digital economy. How do we understand the benchmark of countries and cities with regard to the penetration of both basic, applied and disruptive uh, digital skills, how do we understand exactly where European economies sit vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their, their global neighbours, but also how is this then broken down on a sub-national basis as well. But as well as that, as well as that foundational piece, also understanding the role of disruptive, uh, disruptive digital skills in the global economy. So over the six, next six to nine months, we'll be looking particularly at the impact and the penetration of AI skills and cybersecurity skills as well, to understand exactly are they diffusing across the workforce, where is the workforce of the future going to come in that regard, and how do we assist transitions into, into those roles. Now, I don't know how much time I have left. Am I running close? Or? Yes, one, minute. one minute, okay, great. Um, so, 
this just gives you a picture of some of the policy-making institutions that we've worked with uh, around, around the world. We are participants in the Development Data Partnership, which some people might be aware of, which is a consortium set up with the World Bank, the IMF, and the OECD, uh, and a number of private sector providers to make uh, our data available to, uh, to international research organisations to allow them to inform their funding decisions as well. I'm sure these slides will be made available to participants afterwards, so you can see some of the other worked examples that I've set out. Uh, the World Bank we've worked with, for example, and how they uh, to use skills data, uh, informing business leadership through the World Economic Forum, uh, assessing gender equity with the International Labour Organization, uh, working with the OECD, OECD to understand uh, AI skills penetration, uh, working with the ECB to feature our indicators in their macroeconomic bulletins, uh, and then working with the IDB on the question of skills transferability as well. So a, a whistle-stop tour, no doubt, and I hope that kind of gives, sets the scene for the discussion later on, but thank you for your time and attention, and please feel free to come up to me afterwards as well to learn more. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Sheen, and this was an exercise in how quickly can you go through a slide deck <laughs> and still, and still make sense, and uh, this was impressive. Uh, thanks so much. And so last but not least, we have Rafael de Hoyos uh, from the World Bank, uh, where he is leading uh, all the work around human development in the EU, and where he will focus uh, uh, in this talk about vocational education and training systems. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah. So my uh, uh, previous uh, panel uh, members were talking about innovations. I will talk about a sector that needs to be innovated as opposed to showing you an innovation. And I apologize for, you, for, for, for those of you that participated in the World Bank session yesterday. I will be drawing on many of the uh, messages that I was uh, making yesterday and trying to delve a bit more into what are the policy implications of the work that we're doing at the bank. So why, why do I think that we need an innovation in vocational education and training systems? Well, if you think about all the, the uh, innovative experiences that we just heard and we think about how technology enters the firm, Technology enters the firm when a new technology is adopted by a firm, the firm re-optimizes, and this re-optimization process creates new tasks, destroys uh, some tasks, and this creation and destruction of tasks ends up in uh, differences in demand for different skills. So that manifests in the labor market as a change in the demand for skills. Now, this has two implications for the uh, last 20 years in terms of labor markets, uh, and it will change, uh, uh, it will have a profound change for labor markets in the following 20 to 30 years. The first one is that we tend to have tenures in formal labor markets that were larger in terms of spells, in terms of number of years. Once you graduated, you got a job, you get this job for, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years. So now what the data is showing, and this is what the two graphs uh, that I'm showing right now uh, are displaying, that the number of years in terms of tenure is reducing over the last 25 years. So now there's, there's the need to reinvent yourself, if you wish, in terms of your career. I'm an economist, and I have to be keep up with the literature, with all the papers that Eric is uh, uh, writing, uh, to be at the uh, uh, cutting edge. So the other, the other implication of the little model that I just showed you in terms of differences in tasks is that there has been in the last 20 to 25 years an important change in that demand for different types of skills. So we've seen in the last uh, 15 years that the demand for social skills and the demand for non-cognitive analytical skills have increased substantially. And at the same time, the demand for manual or uh, non-routine manual job uh, t tasks have decreased over time. Now, if you think about how rapid the labor market is moving in terms of its demand for skills, you would have thought that something similar 
is happening in the supply of skills. So education systems should be adapting to this profound change that I just showed you, lower ten tenure and a higher demand for, not, uh, for cognitive high order skills and social skills. But what happens is that at least one sector, an important one in, the, in terms of Europe, is very rigid. It doesn't change over time. And that is the vocational education and training system. More or less half of the European kids that go through upper secondary go to a vocational education and training systems. They tend to be poorer. This is uh, data from PISA 2018. This is for Greece, but it, it pretty much captures what happens in EU 27. Kids go into the vocational system tend to be poorer. They tend to get a lower return for their education investment and they have lower what we call foundational skills, literacy and numeracy. This means that when you look at the same graph that I just showed you in terms of what happened to the different tasks over time, the sector, the graduates that experience the least change in terms of the tasks of their occupations are the graduates from the vocational education and training system. So some policy options, two. The first one is that Europeans should consider moving their vocational systems closer to the general track in three dimensions. The first one is that education systems should ensure that all kids, regardless of their track, they get these foundational skills, basic numeracy, basic literacy, and social emotional skills. The second one, they should get rid of some countries, they still have these dead ends. If you go to a vocational track, you cannot continue studying into the higher education, into university. They should get rid of that. And they should also get rid of tracking. This assessment that sometimes is being applied when kids are as young as 13, 15 years old and determines the rest of their life is just crazy. It's just like perpetuating replicating and exacerbating inequalities. Finally, I think that coming from the other side, I am Mexican, I'm coming from the other side of the Atlantic, and I've been working in Europe for the last year, and one of the things that disappoint me a lot is to see how little evidence-based policymaking is uh, in, this side, in this region of the world, despite the fact that you have lots of resources, you have lots of human capital, you have the people capable of, of producing this evidence, when it comes to policy making and decision making, it's just like, it's, it's the intuition and, and think about all the resources that the European Commission has and is distributing to the European Union member states. It has a, a natural lab to create and generate knowledge. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Raphael, and that sets the stage for a great panel discussion uh, immediately. And let me go, uh, and, and I had some questions prepared, but uh, uh, given the fact that we have uh, short in time, I, I will uh, redirect some of those, and I will focus on each of you and ask one question. And I, I, let me start with uh, Avi. Uh, you've shown some uh, really interesting uh, and innovative ways to actually conduct studies within Estonia. But I want to pick uh, upon what Raphael said. How do we turn that into then actually action? And so can you tell us a little bit about how the tool that you've built really informs uh, decision-making within Estonia? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What are the success factors? And again, this is a lot of questions, but uh, if you could uh, reflect on uh, how is actually evidence which you produce then used in actually uh, policy making and educational kind of uh, uh, innovation as well. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the proposals that the service make. So we monitor them. So when the proposal is made, we, after two years uh, at least, and sometimes a little bit uh, later if it's needed, or but sometimes also sooner, we come back to the pro proposal and see what is happening. So uh, if nothing is happening, uh, we just uh, 
ring the bell again or bang, bang the drums. And so that's, that's the only thing that we can do regarding the proposals. And other things that, <coughs> as I emphasized before, uh, the stakeholders come together and, and that's already something, you know, when you have this uh, debate uh, regarding the proposals and initiatives and ideas. And um, we have made this joke amongst us that um, if uh, one of the stakeholders is very happy about, like, constantly happy, then we are doing something wrong. <laughs> so we are basically... Uh, uh, if we are accused by all the stakeholders by not taking them into account, we are okay. <laughs> so, so basically, we are trying to um, to uh, uh, to cope the societal need, and that needs uh, taking into account all perspectives, and uh, and that's uh, something we try to do, and it's hard to do, but uh, we will. Um, we have already seen uh, certain results regarding, for example, before there was uh, talk about that sometimes the skills mismatch is not uh, caused due to the fact that uh, schools are doing something wrong or they are like uh, two uh, uh, little graduates coming out from this um, uh, qualification system, but it's also because of something that companies are lacking or companies are not doing. So we point out those uh, problems uh, publicly, uh, especially about vocational education system. We have had so many debates and we see now uh, um, that the vocational education system is coming nearer to the higher education, but also nearer to the basic education, which is basically like something that we have achieved uh, and something that we wanted to achieve. But these are just some examples. Great, thanks so much. And a quick, quick follow-up question. Do you have a stick, uh, I mean a mandate, to actually say you didn't follow our proposals? Because anyway, yeah. what Raphael was saying is that there's a lot of evidence, but it's not applied to policy making, and quite often it's because there's no accountability uh, with regard to using evidence. We don't want to be policemen, so we, 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 don't, we don't aim at that. So uh, we aim at, uh, at uh, making arguments strong enough to not dispute them. <laughs> Good. Pirita, uh, you are acting, anyway, with your wonderful uh, RoboCoast, which was very impressive, by the way. Um, you're acting also at the local level. And so what I'm trying to understand, uh, which is part of the anyway, context of this panel, is can the local level be helps of experimentation on doing things differently that we can learn from? And so eager to hear from you, what's your view on the role of actually local level experimentation and innovation that then perhaps can inform supranational kind of policy making as well and how does that uh, go? Now, okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, um, uh, in local way, we we have uh, talking about our city of Pori, uh, which is we only have eighty thousand people are living in our city. That um, there is the strong companies need that uh, we need the digital skills here in this area. The companies say that in probably now in the future we needed two hundred and four to four hundred peoples about uh, AI specialist and, and cyber security and that kind of things. Now, what happened then? When we say about that in our city, then we decided that we go to company also to do it research about asking what is the, your needs. After that, we decided that we start to sharing those companies who already done very well and, and offer the company uh, little funds uh, to educate it already to people there or uh, giving funds for that kind of things that they educated the people who are not employed people uh, who have some digital skills but not so exactly particular. We're looking for those people. We offer that kind of educational system and especially short courses. We do uh, RoboCoast education uh, platform. We introduce the, what is in AI good practicing, we are, uh, say about there also, it's online, it's free for everybody, you can go to watch, and, and there's uh, some kind of, uh, that kind of, if you be interesting about it, those kind of digital skills, that what should made it, 
and and it's happened that uh, in local way that you need to, as you mentioned about, you need to get everybody in the table who have decision making people, and then that kind of then we start to discuss. But uh, as you said about, we are not either a policymaker or something like that, but we need to push the company. We need to push for our local uh, local. Uh, cities that they understand, and you mentioned about that educational things that uh, we want in our cities that uh, robotics will be all level. I teach about kindergarten teach. We have IoT uh, toys. I go to inter uh, Internet of Toys with the kindergarten, and I do research about that. And all levels we want that. It's not yet existing. But it's coming, and we already have robotic competition about it. People, uh, teachers are loving that, that they are doing that. But we needed that. And it's coming like local way, and then can come up to, uh, to separate it about it the global way and, and in the EU level and that kind of things. Great, thanks. Um, Shin, um, kind of a different question to you, not about the substance, but really about LinkedIn itself, right? And so... LinkedIn is a leader in actually using its own data to inform policymakers. And unfortunately, <laughs> there are many other corporations that have data that could be useful for policymakers, but they don't uh, do the things that uh, LinkedIn is doing. So question to you, what's the business case for LinkedIn to actually develop the economic graph that then anyway can inform policymakers that others then can say, well, this is what we should, why we should actually do what LinkedIn is doing as well? So I think the first thing I'd say is not for me to tell other co corporations how they should approach this sort of thing. I'm sure they'd have a different view. But what I would say from LinkedIn's point of view, the reason that we do it, it, it is aligned with that vision I set out of creating economic opportunity for, for every member of, of the global workforce. That we, as a company, believe that you know talent is distributed all over the earth, uh, but opportunity isn't necessarily there as well. And when you have access to a global network, that has that near real-time data, that has that granularity, there is a compelling case that if you are serious about your vision, then you work with policymakers to unlock that. And what I would say from the business point of view, we don't just approach policymakers and say, hey, we want to work with you on policy. We want them to tell us, well, yes, we will use your insights for impact. Um, so for example, we've worked with the city of Barcelona uh, to help them inst inform their digital strategy fund. But it was a very clear partnership from the get-go that we want them to tell us very clearly, how will you use these insights? What will change as a, as a result of this? And when we're choosing those partners we work with, we choose partners who have access to those levers, who can influence it, whether they be policymakers um, that can actually you know, put firepower behind what they want to do, or if they're research organizations, the likes of IFO in, in, in Germany or the likes of um, the ESRI in, in Ireland, that influence the policy debate uh, as well. Um, because none of what we do here is monetary. It is all entirely based on uh, that, that impact piece. So again, that's an important distinction for us, is that we don't just do this for the sake of our health. We do this because we want to see impact uh, drive from it as well. And that's why we, I think we are respected by the partners that we work with. But certainly, we don't see ourselves just as handing over, handing over data. We see ourselves as co-designing research um, projects, which I think any partner that we worked with in the past uh, would attest to. So maybe not the juicy answer that you wanted to the question, but I think that very much sets out uh, the view we take uh, in forming these partnerships. No, I think th this is great, but I, I do, anyway, want to understand is that I mean, there is a cost involved for LinkedIn to do mm -hmm. this, right? And so clearly it's aligned with social responsibility, but uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, anyway, how, 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 how can you keep this doing, right? If, uh, if, if it's only for social responsibility. I'm trying to understand, is there a business case behind it as well? So I, I think it just shows that we're serious with that vision, right? So, you know, we bristled a little bit when we said it's in the social responsibility section. It's not. We're, just, we're very distinct from our social responsibility win. I, I think it's better to think of what we do as a sort of a think tank, um, similar to what the McKinsey Global Institute would do, or um, the, the likes of the, or the World Economic Forum would do, that we... we seen maybe as, as a responsibility to the policy-making community to provide access to this information, but not just for the sake of it. If it was just social responsibility, I think we'd more likely just be pushing stuff out all the time. We're actually very deliberate about who we work with, and we're very deliberate about the research we do. We decide the research themes that we want to pursue. So informing that debate and helping navigating the world of work is what's, uh, what's important to us. Great, great. 
Raphael, um, very compelling um, uh, presentation. But from my point of view, um, it's not just about uh, responding to the demand. There's also an ethical aspect of what you actually presented, right? So what's the ethical aspect of actually innovating in a way that gives uh, those that are already vulnerable and quite often um, excluded uh, actually a new pathway? And uh, like in, in the US, there is a lot of discussion now about what's the, is it ethical to train individuals knowing that the jobs they will get will be fully paid <laughs> and, and provide for no career path, right? And so, question to you, what's the ethical implication of what you actually were presenting here? Yeah, thanks. I think that that um, is not only the ethical dilemma, but it's also poor economics, right? So, if you think about the fact that in EU27, there are one in four 15-year-old kids do not comprehend texts. One in four kids do not use basic math operations to understand the world around them. And you still have these systems that are investing in creating professional competences for these same kids, knowing, as you well said, that we don't know if that will be demanded right now by the market, but we certainly know that it won't be demanded in 20 years into the future. So how can we take such a decision? Why don't we invest in making sure that these 25% of the kids enrolled right now, all of them get to the minimum level of foundational skills? And, and as I said before, this is not only unethical, but it's also poor economics. Because think about all the innovations, ideas, inventions that the Europeans are losing because one-fourth of their potential innovations are lost in these kids that do not get to minimum levels. So there is an ethical component, there is a poor economics, and there's also a political one. If you think about the most important challenge that we are facing right now, or one of the most important challenges around the world, is growing inequalities. And growing inequalities is at the heart of what I just showed you. Uh, the best, uh, um, uh, let's say, future with that, or, or, or this crystal ball with the future that we have in terms of what will happen to income distribution in the future is the disparities that we observe right now in terms of learning outcomes. And COVID just exacerbated these disparities. So now it's a time to just think about why are we in the current stage? Why do we keep with some sort of inertia from 1960, uh, feeding these systems of vocational without stopping and thinking, well, are we actually helping our poorest kids by uh, confining them to this type of education or not? Great. Looking to Tatiana, who is in charge here, uh, <laughs> and can tell us whether we have time for uh, one or two more questions or whether everyone, yeah? Two questions. Anyone, um, any questions to this distinguished panel? And do we have questions online, um, perhaps? No? No questions? There was a question over there. And any other questions? Otherwise, we can take the two questions together. Thanks. No? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's, it's actually a general question, but I'd like to hear your views, but it's a little bit in line with uh, what Raphael was saying. So let me think of um, a suburb neighborhood in whatever city you want in Europe. Uh, I've been living in the UK, so I can think of a UK town. And, and I can see kids, a uh, lot of kids, which are born in families where nobody works. Right? They mainly are in unemployment benefit. They normally spend, the parents spend most of their time at home. Uh, sometimes they drink, sometimes they're not. Uh, and these kids, what they ba basically do is then you know, hang out with other kids that do similar things. So if, if, if we take their perspective of what the world is, uh, skills, education, values, nothing, right? There's not even a perspective for work. So if we take their own, uh, you know, agency in, in, in what would they decide to do, it wouldn't be any school, it wouldn't be any foundational skill, it wouldn't be any, any specific skill. 
because they simply don't know. So don't we have a more you know, overarching challenge here, which is inequality? But I don't think that you know, we can just say, give them the skills and it will work. Uh, I think we can, first of all, you know, <laughs> give, give, give um, you know, a dis redistributions, uh, a little bit like Gabriel was saying this morning, so uh, opportunities to interact. And, and this is also because of the huge polarization that we see in society. I mean, these, these neighborhoods are isolated. And, and they're not isolated because of their own choice. They're isolated because of the choice of those who live in the center and deliver the, the, the skills. So is there a more you know, problematic challenge in terms of reducing inequality here? Great. And we have one more question because that was like more of a <laughs> comment <laughs> uh, or, or the start of another uh, Horizon research network. But, uh <laughs> I have one question to, to Shane. So one, one of the studies we, we, we did together was on, on the automotive industry and, and the digital skills in the automotive industry. So we all know that the car producers now all want to become tech companies and uh, software becomes more and more important. And what we see in, in the study basically is that they do not get the dig digital skills by, by upgrading the incumbent employees, but uh, simply by hiring new employees who have these digital skills. So related to this, I wonder to what extent do you help companies as well as agencies to design the content, content of training measures? <clears throat> That's a really interesting question, and it brings me back to my, my previous employment, uh, where I looked at that very question of work-based learning, and that employers were the main vehicle for, for, for training. So I think that's a, it's an area of work we're going to start looking at ourselves over the next few years, is understanding what sort of skill formation happens inside company, as opposed to the primary focus of our work thus far has been, as you say, looking at flows in and out of industries, looking at flows in and out, in and out uh, of countries. But actually, that skill formation and skill acquisition piece is something that we'll be tacking towards, especially as part of the digital work stream that we're going to be doing o over, over the year as well. I mean, for what it's worth, um, we know from the research that work-based learning is the most effective form of adult training and adult education in terms of the outcomes it delivers as well. I think it's incumbent on us then as researchers to understand how do we actually track that happening in inside companies. And if it is enough that, you know, if someone says, okay, I've got a certification from my employer that I've upgraded on this skill, I put it up on LinkedIn, that would be the way that we would probably uh, address doing that. The, the missing link for us there is making sure we have a certification structure and a certification program that employers can impart to their, their employees to put on LinkedIn. And that is something that we're, we're looking at as well. So we haven't got enough done on it yet, but it is something that we're very conscious of. We, we want to focus on the future because I think that's the next big piece, especially when you think of the likes of Tommaso's example of the town in the UK where there isn't as much opportunity apparent, that is where those sort of interve interventions will happen. It, you, the, the solution to all our upskilling problems can't be, well, how do we identify to attract new people in? There will come a point where policymakers need to say, well, how do we form those actual, actual skills in those communities? And if that means go right down to the most basic foundational levels around literacy, around numeracy, and build it up that way, that I think is where research now needs to start focusing, as opposed to just talent flows, it needs to be, well, actually, how do we understand talent formation? And of course, if, anyway, if workforce training is the best way, then you do actually have to also focus on how do you actually get into the workforce, right? And <laughs> I think that's quite often where, where the problem starts uh, from an uh, equality perspective. Raphael. So um, may I have an attempt to, it, this is a, 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 a very complex question what Tommaso is uh, um, uh, putting on the table. But I think that if you look at the contemporary correlation between education outcomes and inequality, then it's not very clear where the causality is running. But if you look at it from a medium to long-term perspective and you want to go to the roots of inequality, then it starts not when these kids are 15 years of age, but maybe they didn't receive the early childhood development that they should have. Maybe they went also after the first 10, uh, 1,000 days of their lives not receiving the early stimulation. They went to a school without the proper or a well-qualified and motivated teacher, which is what you usually tend to see 
poor kids go into poor schools. So when, once we want to do something about this, when these kids are teenagers, the evidence is also telling us very clear that it's very hard to revert. It's not impossible, but it's very hard. So then that's why we need to create and generate more evidence uh, in this part of the world to say, how can we make use in an effective way of the resources that we have? And this can be through uh, early childhood development and quality of teaching and quality of education. Great. Avi? I must say I tend to agree with Rafael in that sense that, for example, we have faced these discussions in Estonia regarding some of the well, about vocational education system, that it's some sort of like a social security system also for the kids who come uh, from poor areas. Pro for example, many of those schools are in the periphery of Estonia and they have like a certain uh, a limited possibility to hire teachers and so they learn the cleaning or they learn, uh, learn gardening because it's possible there, but at least it's some sort of an possibility to stay uh, for them out of streets or something like that. What we are trying to say in Estonia is, come on, like we need to tackle this problem so much sooner than in vocational education system. Now we are trying to save those kids from streets. I mean, this is ridiculous. So basically, uh, Exactly that. So, so, uh, so those foundational skills and, and it's exactly that. So uh, we see the lack of them in uh, vocational education system, uh, problems with numeracy, literacy, and, and we need to bring this issue to those uh, areas of periphery sooner and these resources should be directed more towards the, the, the early intervention of the problem. Yeah, no, I mean, we do quite some work on cycles of disadvantage because it is a cycle, right? Once you're in, it's very hard to get out. And uh, and skills is, anyway, acquisition is one or early anyway, interventions are one, but it's a much more complex uh, uh, topic area. But I think it would be interesting to actually look into what's the role of, for instance, uh, those interventions because we don't really have that much kind of uh, uh, evidence that really tries to understand how do you break the cycle because once you're in, it's very hard to get out. With that... Um, I think we are um, probably at, at time. <laughs> Maria had, as always, the last very hard question that she wanted to pose, but uh, I think uh, it's probably going to have to be over lunch. Um, Avi, Priyata, Perita, sorry, <laughs> Raphael and Sheen, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom and especially thanks for being willing to be on a panel where we had to really rush uh, and get uh, everything established here. But uh, I learned a lot. Thanks so much for uh, doing so. Thank you. Bye-bye. I had prepared three, three sites, three, three pages of notes <laughs> over the last one and a half days for my closing remarks, but I will skip this regarding uh, the advanced time and the increasing temperature. Um, but I want to use two minutes to say thank you. So first of all, thank you to the panelists today, to the moderators today, thank you to the presenters yesterday, and also thank you to a really passionate audience who made this event really a success. But I would also say, would like to say thank you to the people behind the conference. So thank you to Deirdre Weber, thank you to Nina Czernich and, and Jason Warren who organized the whole thing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to, to Marco Siebler and Romo, Romy Vinogradova, um, who, who are the camera team, and also thank you to Julio Saavedra and Eva Hartbeck, who accompanied the conference with yeah, their communication activities. <clears throat> and last but not least, again, uh, thank you to the Bavarian representation here in Brussels, and especially to Ms. Retter for hosting um, this event um, in this really great, how you called it, oasis. <laughs> that's, that's, that's really true. So thanks a lot to the Bavarian representation. <clears throat> so please keep in touch with the Pillars project. So 
we inform you about the latest research on our webpage. Um, follow us on Twitter and on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, also subscribe to our newsletter and we will inform you about future events and our future research. So now it's time for lunch. <clears throat>